The new Hero Crowd social impact platform will not only assist budding entrepreneurs to launch a service or product, but also help ensure its success. So who better to have on Reclaim the Narrative than people who have already endured the trials and tribulations of building a successful business? Our guest today is Jilani Gulam. He's the CEO and founder of Health IQ, a data-driven service that provides intelligence and insights to healthcare providers. Big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning. Health IQ is at the forefront of all of these phenomena. And Iman Sadaruddin, founder of Extrava, a health tech company that develops diagnostic tools that you can use from the comfort of your home. So how did they get to where they are and how can we emulate their success? So let's get started here, guys. Um, first off, a question for both of you. And before I really ask about each of your specific journeys and the paths you each took, I thought it would be interesting to take a step back and ask both of you to perhaps talk about a modern day entrepreneurial story that inspires you and the reasons behind that. Uh, Iman, care to start? Yeah, absolutely. Salam alaikum. Pleasure uh, to be on the panel and, and be with you today. Um, my, my modern day kind of uh, example, it goes back a, a little bit and um, I grew up obviously in the, in the late 90s and I always felt like I missed the first dot-com boom. And this was kind of something that was on my mind throughout going to school and studying computer sciences. Uh, I missed the first boom, I won't miss the second one. And so I had this inclination in the back of my mind, even though I was working for other companies and, and I, I was learning a lot of necessary skills that would come in handy, I always wanted to be prepared and be ready that when the next opportunity presented itself, I, I wouldn't miss it. And obviously there's plenty of entrepreneurial stories that are around today, but I don't necessarily want to gravitate towards sending rocket ships to space. And many of us cannot, uh, find our, our narrative in those stories. We're, we don't have the same backgrounds. We don't have the same capital. We don't have the same network. So we have to find things that are a little bit more relevant to our own situation. And, and I get inspired all the time. I, I talk to a lot of startup investor uh, and startup entrepreneurs and the way they, the faith that they have, the commitment that they have, the way they can pivot, they don't give up. That inspires me, even though they may look at me as someone who's further along than them, I get inspired by their perseverance and willingness to continue uh, to fight through and, and work through challenges with the dream of you know, having a successful venture. Fantastic, and uh, Jelani? Assalamu alaikum brothers, um, and sisters. Um, I think um, that there's a tendency for people to look up to the likes of, I don't know, Steve Jobs or Elon Musk or, you know, uh, Bill Gates or so on. Um, and, you know, I, I, I have a bit of an issue with this. And the reason why is because there is a perception that to be a great CEO or to be a great entrepreneur, you have to be ruthless. You have to be really harsh. You have to be rude. Um, and not just not a nice person, frankly. Um, there's also this idea that in order to be successful, you've got to be what is called a rock star CEO. And actually, the people that inspire me are people most people have never heard of. So for example, uh, Iman, you know, he told me he's born, in, he, he grew up in the 90s, it kind of makes me feel a little bit old. I, 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 grew, I was born in 1977, so I've, I've got a few more years on him. Um, so th there's, there's some people that, you know, maybe a lot of people haven't heard of, people like, for example, George Kane, CEO of, of, of Abbott Labs which is one of the largest pharmaceutical firms. Um, he built that firm himself. He destroyed the nepotism that was, that, that was contained in that company. He even sacked his, his nephews um, to build a company that is enduring. Uh, Louis Gessner of IBM, uh, who repositioned uh, IBM when it was in a failing market. Um, Coleman Mockler, CEO of Gillette from 1975 to 1991. Um, you know, you probably wouldn't have heard of any of these guys, but, you know, uh, Coleman Mockler could have made something like $100 million back in, in the 70s if he sold his company to Revlon, but he refused because he wanted to do what was right for Gillette and refused the aggressive takeover, even though he would have personally made a lot of money 
very humble guy, very quiet, but built an a, a, a enduring company. And this is one of the, I guess, one of the insights you get when you start on this journey is actually there's so many people you've never heard of when you look beyond the, you know, the, the surface. And the person that inspired me the most is actually Warren Buffett. You know, this is a guy that still drives the same car, still lives in the same apartment, um, you know, is more concerned about his staff and more concerned about his shareholders than either by himself, very rarely wants to talk about himself, um, you know, looks at failure as part of a journey, uh, praises other people for their success, and is one of the best man motivators there is. So for me, that's the kind of person I, I, I look for. And I, I, I'd like people to look away from some of the examples that are given because I think it's too daunting and it's just not realistic. <clears throat> no, really insightful there. Interesting. So kind of going more on, on the personal side. So I'm sure our viewers like to learn more about kind of your personal individual journeys. Um, please do tell us your story. You know, how you got started, how you scaled up, how you were able to take your venture, your companies all the way through to an exit. And kind of when you're explaining your journey, it would be great if you could also tell us at what point or at what moment along your journey did you, did you each experience a make or break moment and how did you handle that? Iman, if you wanna go. Yeah, absolutely. I'll try to keep it uh, brief. Um, so my journey started, and this is probably relevant for any as aspiring entrepreneur. Uh, as I said earlier, I was working at different jobs. And at that time, I had the best job I, I ever had. And it was the best position, the best salary, but I just knew I had to break away. And it took that, that excitement, that leap of faith, wanting to work with people I, I liked and to, to, to make that jump. And it was, it was on a Thanksgiving day. I was walking down the street in San Francisco with my, with my bamboo plant, excited that I had just quit my job. And so obviously the, what, led, what was going to be ahead, I would have never uh, imagined, right? So it was, it was very challenging. But my company was focused on e-commerce and this was in 2007. So e-commerce was starting to ramp up. And the goal was to build a very, very customizable platform where retailers could make everything pixel perfect and it had to be crazy fast. So we were just uh, stuck on this point and we used to measure every little thing and we wanted to have the world's fastest shopping experience. And so, you know, that's what we were working on. We 16 hours a day, seven days a week, didn't see my family much, I, as much as I hate to say it. Uh, it took a lot of uh, work and I found how you said like some of the, like the crazy things that happened along the way. I, I recall a, a year and a half or so into the venture, it was around midnight at the office and I'm walking over to, to the kitchen area and my, my partner is like, come over here. Google's launching something like our stuff. Google's launched commerce search. And you're just like frozen at that moment, like it's over, you know, Google's now uh, interested in the same space and we're doomed. And I won't, I won't kid with you. It was scary. It was intimidating. Uh, we were good at tech, but obviously they were, and they have deep pockets and money for marketing and sales. So we were, we were scared, but you know, what could we do? Right. And so when it's your first startup, you almost like, is it time to pack up and go home? That's it. And, and just, and you know, that's just give up. So we try to have a positive spin, you know, if Google's doing this, that means there must be money in the space. There must be something good. We're onto something. And so we'll try to be as good. We'll try to be more niche and, and keep going. So we didn't give up. We kept cranking along and try to get customers on board, had to learn a lot about sales, a lot about marketing. And I would like to highlight just one really important turning point for us was when we started to emphasize what we could do for our customers and the way we can incre increase their conversion and their sales because of our technology, rather than just emphasizing what our technology was and how great it was. And as simple as that idea seems, I, we literally had to re-change re you know, the, the website and the verbiage to be around what it was in it for them as opposed to how wonderful we were. And, and this, this dramatically changed the trajectory of the company. We, more people started to see the value and were willing to pay for it. And we started doing very strategic integrations with bigger companies, 
which helped us get on their radar, which is, a, I think, an important thing. If your M&A is on your mind, or even if it's not, you just want to make sure that other people in the space, people that would be interested, know that, that you exist. And eventually, those companies started seeing us bringing customers and money to them. And so this is where it, what led to the M&A interest. And to be honest, we weren't, we weren't looking. We were still like very much excited about what we're doing. We didn't know much about M&A. We didn't know much about all those types of things. And we had to quickly educate ourselves on how that worked. And eventually the numbers made sense and we decided to you know, sell the company. And it was because of a broader vision. You could see that, that the acquiring company was very much interested in what we had and was, that was a huge part of their vision and their roadmap. So it, it made sense. And so that was kind of the, the first journey. And, and, just, and guess what, at the end, Google shut down commerce search anyway. So that was, can you imagine if we had just walked away and then later on we see that Google just said, this is, this is not for them and they, and they left. So that's, that's kind of my first uh, startup uh, story for you, Fahad, and, and the rest really of Really interesting. Before Jelani, go to you, a quick follow-up question, Iman. So is, is that common where a lot of entrepreneurs are working on their projects, their companies, and they don't have M&A on their mind and other companies, larger companies come to them and kind of say, hey, are you willing to sell? And kind of how does that discussion happen with you and your partners and your, and your colleagues? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I, maybe it happens less now um, than, than before. Uh, I think right now m and and I'll discuss this probably later on when we have a chance, but m and is a lot, a lot on everyone's mind. They keep reading the news about startups and, and exits. So I believe maybe the modern day entrepreneur is a little bit more aware of that. At our time, not even on our radar. And when it happened, literally getting books from buying books on how to sell companies and trying to like not, not fall into the major pitfalls and mistakes. And uh, alhamdulillah, we were very blessed because a lot of the stuff we ended up reading, we had just done not knowing that we were doing some best practices. And, and when it comes to selling, you know, you obviously, you start to do projections and imagine, okay, at this revenue, if we get this many more customers. So we had to build a bunch of Excel spreadsheets and run different models to see where we were headed and, and did it make sense. And so eventually it made sense and, and the rest is history. Right. Jelani, let's hear your story and uh, the crisis moment that you might have experienced during that journey. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll do my best after uh, Iman's. I feel inspired already, to be honest. Um, so I think for me, um, it's probably best to talk about two things kind of related. People sometimes get them confused. One is a dream and the other, the other is a vision. And I, I I'll explain what I mean by that. So I, I was born in Bangladesh and I came to Britain in 1981. Um, I remember coming, the first thing that struck me was it's cold. This is a cold country. You know, this, this is, I, I grew up in a hot country. I just couldn't, I couldn't compute the cold. In fact, after 43 years, I still can't deal with the cold of this country. It's just something that gets into your bones. Come, come here to Chicago, and then you'll see what cold really is. Oh, I've been, I, I, I've been, I've been to the state. I'm there every every two months, so yeah, I, I'm very familiar with the states. And and I, I was in Boston in uh, in January, February, and it was cold there too. So um, yeah, I, I, I've uh, so so had that pleasure already. But um, you know, I I was the son of an immigrant. I came to the country, um, and you know, we, we we kind of went through the schooling system. Um, I think within the first couple of weeks, I was robbed five, probably probably 10 times in 10 days by s some of the white kids. And I use the word loosely. I use the word white loosely because I don't like to stereotype and say white, black, Asian, whatever. I, I, you know, it just happened to be that they were white. Um, and, you know, I, I had to be I had to be strong, you know. And, and so a lot of the things that happened to me over the years which I thought were struggles, I now look back and I, I feel blessed that Allah gave me those challenges. You know, that, that kind of experience made me, made me a fighter. I learned, I probably learned every type of martial art since that time. You know, I do grappling, I do boxing, do Thai boxing, BJJ, wrestling, Olympic wrestling, um, you know, judo, I've just done them all because, and I'm not, I'm not a naturally aggressive person, it's because I had to learn to defend myself. And this is what it led to, and I guess, what I'm trying to say is, as the son of an immigrant, I had no, there was no silver spoon. There was nobody there to tell me what to do, how to do it. 
all I had was challenges, right? And um, I remember as a young man, as a young boy, thinking one day I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something big. I didn't know what that big thing was. Um, but I just, I remember, I, I can still remember at the age of seven or eight thinking, I want to do something big. And that, that went into my, you know, school years. Um, I, I gravitated naturally to some things which at the time was seemed to be very strange. So for example, at the age of nine, um, I learned to program on a eight bit computer, um, probably in, I don't know, 85, 86. This is when computers were not vogue. You kind of if you played with computers, you probably got bullied at school. So um, we, 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 we kind of had to keep that a secret, but, but it's dreams. And the point I'm trying to make is, you know, without dreams, you have no conception of what you can achieve. And one of the things I strongly encourage people, especially with their children is let them dream because the dream will give you something to aspire to. And it's really, really, really important. And there's a, there's a strong correlation with things like Lego and creative, creative play that then creates adults who are incredibly smart and incredibly driven. So, uh, you know, that's, 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 I think, something really important. If, if any of you guys have watched the program called The Last Dance on, on uh, Netflix, you, you'll see Michael Jordan and you'll see that drive, that passion, the inability to give up. I'm sure Iman will relate to this. Everything is against you. You will fail or you will fail again. The question is, are you going to get up or are you going to fight? That's, that's, that, so, so you have to have that inside you. You never want to be second best. I never wanted to be second best. If I lost in anything, I want to know why and I want to come back and I actually want to come back stronger. N never really content. And this is important because long-term entrepreneurs are not driven by money. This is a very interesting thing. Not, I'm not driven by money. Money follows if you focus on the thing that you're passionate about. It will naturally occur. You don't have to worry and target that. It, it, it's just one of those natural truisms of life. So um, to abbreviate the story, I, I went and, you know, I, I did a bunch of things in my career. I kind of ended up in data because I, I, I had a programming background and I got headhunted by the BBC. Uh, and again, this is really another story for another day as to why to launch something called iPlayer, which at the time was cutting edge. This is 2007. So this is before, you know, uh, video on demand. I had to explain to my wife what the concept of streaming online meant because people were like hey that's impossible you know just bear in mind at the time netflix and love film were sending dvds in the post so we built something which was truly innovative um <clears throat> and from there you know i kind of had a couple of uh, experiences and i realized i mean put it this way the, the joke i have is before i did i play i had hair after I play, I lost that. So I kind of realized, hey, I'm, I'm losing assets. I need, to, I need to make it worth my while, right? So, um, you know, uh, I, 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 I became very close friends with, who, with, with a chap who's now my business partner. Um, and we formed Health IQ. Again, you know, I'm just, I'm just really cutting the story short. And the next thing is vision. So Health IQ started off, we tried everything. We tried recruitment. We tried consultancy in hospitals. Um, the thing we ended up with has very little correlation with what we started. And the reason why I mentioned this is the first thing is dream. So must dream to give you a conception of what's possible. Vision is about, there is this really um, incorrect notion that entrepreneurs and, you know, clever business guys, they come along and they have this really grand vision and they turn up and they know exactly what they're going to do and they make it reality. That is an absolute untrue. In reality, you start somewhere, and the analogy I give is you have a boat, a ship, and you sail in the general direction, like Columbus. You generally, you generally go west. You don't know where you're going to go, right? And as you get closer to the horizon, as you get closer to the shore, you decide which island you want to jump off of. And that is very similar to visions. So you don't need a vision. But as Iman has said, you have to be, what I say, you have to be in it to win it. So if Iman is not there developing an e-commerce solution, he doesn't know that Google are going to cancel, but he's there, he's ready, he's done something already. And when the market shifts and changes, he, he takes advantage of it. So unless you're there, right, you can't take advantage of it. So this idea that you need a grand vision, honestly, forget it. That's just for books and that's for, for movies. Most of these guys did not have an idea of what they're going to do. And I include Facebook in that, by the way. Um, and in the end, they come out with a notion that works and I'll explain in one of my, one of my answers down, downstream as to why that happens. Um, so Health IQ was formed and we kind of focused in the end on, on big data. 
um, and some very clever tech, which I, again, I won't bore you with. Um, the company grew pretty aggressively. And in 2019, we sold to a company called Corona. By the way, no relation to the virus. I'm not responsible for the virus. Before anybody asks me, it's got nothing to do with me. Uh, Corona very, uh, for, very um, coincidentally stands for Confederation of Rheumatologists of North America, which is abbreviated to Corona. Um, and we were acquired uh, by, by Corona in 2019. Um, and since that time, uh, since after the acquisition, uh, uh, Corona obviously liked my humor and my charm, so they put me on their board. Um, and I, I, I now have probably one of the leading shares in, in the organization. The company was recapitalized last year for about just under $300, $300 million. Um, and our, our aim is to get to one, one billion by 2024. Fantastic. And sorry, real quick here. I mean, during this entrepreneurial journey, so I know you had a, when you first moved to the UK, you had some struggles, but was there a crisis moment you had, you know, during actual startup entrepreneurial journey that made you kind of take a step back and reflect and kind of how did you handle that? Honestly, if I had the, I can tell you one thing, every year there's a crisis. Every single year I can, you know, for, for any given year, I can tell you something happens you do not expect. Every, every year you, you get a curveball. So for example, in, in, in no one's risk log, did, did anyone plan for, for, for COVID-19? You know, but here we are. We're basically uh, doing this online and, 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 and the whole world has changed around us, right? So, so I, I guess the big inflection point for us is we decided to either focus on, um, on hospital, uh, you know, the, the, the hospital market or the pharmaceutical market uh, a life sciences company market and we chose life sciences because of a number of factors and I think that's the point at which we decided you know what this is going to work because ev uh, everything we sold just 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 felt natural in that market. Fantastic good to know that and I appreciate you using the uh, baseball analogy there curveball for our American American audience here. I just I just need to uh, uh, correct you for had in the in everywhere except the US mm -hmm. we call soccer football. I know I you know what uh, when I said that I kind of I smiled inside because I knew all of my all the UK viewers probably are cringing when I when I said that. Okay. Um, no appreciate it. so Iman um, kind of going back to your current endeavor Extrava um, how did you go about identifying the business need for Extrava and the size of the opportunity uh, behind this uh, behind this kind of venture. So I, I think I'm going to just piggyback a little bit on uh, what Jelani said, and I appreciate his comments. Is that you're kind of just going in that general direction, and I think uh, many of us, and I, I, I used to be of the same opinion, where you kind of see the after effect or the the result, and you assume that those executives or the entrepreneur just knew from the get go and had that grand vision and they nailed it. And, and, and it kind of sets the bar to a, so high that it could intimidate or scare people from trying to do something because they're like, how can I get it right? I, I, you know, I mean, I'm probably not as smart or they're so amazing, but we have to realize if you go and, and dig deeper and you look at those stories, they didn't know what exactly they were doing. They were trying different ideas. They maybe f identified a niche or an opportunity, but what they ended up getting to today is not anything what they could have imagined when they first started out. So I think that's important. So how that's relevant to the current venture, we're, we're basically started off looking into healthcare and biosensing and something where it was dear to our hearts. I'm a father of four, my co-founder is a father of five, and we wanted to do baby tech. And we, we knew what the challenges of being parents and sure the technology could have been applied to fitness trackers and things like this, but we felt that there's so many things out there already. Let's do something that we're, we know the pain points and we know how things work. And so we started looking into baby tech, uh, spent a ton of time working on technology. And along the way, when you're doing baby tech, you get pinged a lot about elderly tech and taking care of babies and how can you help us take care of elders. And, and so during that time, you're always thinking about sizing up the opportunity. You have a growing market in baby technology, which is just booming. Last year at CES, there was just days and days of baby tech uh, panels and, and companies. And 
you see where that's going. And at the same time, the elderly population of the world is booming simultaneously. Places like Japan, even the US, like in 30 years from now, like half of our 100 million people will be over, over 65. So these are kind of types of things that are playing in the back of your mind. And like Jelani said, you want to be in the game. You want to be present and not sort of start late after the fact. You want to be ahead. So when time comes, who's the most mature, who spend the most time dealing and thinking about these problems, you're going to be in that discussion. And so what happened even, and startups tell you the truth, guys, is just, and, and you know, to our audience is, things are very dynamic. None of us saw this pandemic coming. I, I definitely did not. And we have to look at this as an opportunity. It's almost like a reset switch. If you were already a, a struggling entrepreneur, maybe this is your chance to, to break out. If you wanted to be an entrepreneur, things have just been redefined. People are wearing masks. People are doing things that you would have never imagined. There are opportunities right there for us to, to jump in and, and make an impact. And the same goes for our, our venture right now at, at Extrava. We, we built a tremendous amount of technology, but at the moment, what we can do to help, and this is our theme right now, is to safely reopen up the global economy. A lot of the stuff that we were working on and thinking about for years are very, very applicable to today's problems. We're talking to hospitals about using our, our biosensing technology and our wearables for breathing. People are worried about their elderly parents that they cannot visit because of, uh, they're afraid they may infect them. So these types of things we're working on were not necessarily for this use case, but they're very applicable. And right now, our sort of our most exciting uh, venture or sub product or thing that we're working on right now is working on high scale uh, COVID-19 testing. Uh, when we started working on that uh, as, a, as a project internally, we didn't think that it was going to be at this scale. But right now we're, we're, we're talking to agencies and we want to talk to the government and even on a global scale, because we have something that we hope, um, inshallah, is going to be a, a game changing mechanism for doing even at home COVID testing. So rather than not knowing if you're positive or not, scared to go out, scared to visit your parents, scared to go to work, uh, having to wait in a line in the U.S. We're backlogged. I mean, we, we, are, we have a tremendous shortage of testing. Our end goal right now is to enable at-home testing. It's gonna, it's, there is more work ahead of us. There's regulatory cha challenges, but the things have changed dramatically. And so I think it behooves us as entrepreneurs and aspiring entrepreneurs to go and evaluate those opportunities right now because um, there, are, there are there. Yeah, that makes total sense. Um, Jelani, kind of switching gears to your side. Um, you're CEO of Health IQ, uh, president of Corona Europe. And needless to say, the health sector is extremely tough to crack. How did you go about building traction to the point of securing your, invest your first investment raise uh, in this sector? Yeah, I think um, what's interesting about what we did um, is Health IQ, uh, IQ did what is known as bootstrapping. And what we mean by that is we actually didn't secure any funding. Um, we, we effectively used our own money, um, our own expertise, our own people and went it alone. The only time we ever took money, uh, the, the only time we took investment was when we sold the company. Um, so we're kind of a little bit odd in that sense. I think, I think Iman has alluded to it in one of his answers, which is I think the culture around companies has changed a lot. So, um, you, you know, back in the day, people didn't start with, a, with the exit in mind, but you'll now find in most, you know, startup manuals, they'll be saying, you know, start with the exit in mind and, you know, build a company. Are you going to build a unicorn? Are, are you building a company which actually has no commercial value, but just has a platform? Um, are, you, are you building EBITDA? Are you building, you know, revenue and so on, right? Um, actually, we wanted to do something different. We wanted to build something that made an impact. Um, and so actually the best advice I'd give, yes, health sector is a tough, uh, sector to crack. To be honest with you, most markets are, are, are hard to crack unless you find something which is growing with a, with a asymmetric, uh, differentiation. And what, and what I mean by that is if you have inside knowledge about something, 
So if you were a tech back in 1998, just before the web boom, you'd, you'd probably make a lot of money. Yeah. If you were a data geek, um, you know, if you, if you were a guy that's, that's under, understood web to a point zero and the value of social media back in 2004, you would have made a lot of money, right? That's, that's what I mean by asymmetric. But um, in most cases, people, you know, any, any market is hard to crack. And the advice I'll give is this, right? Before you go to market, if you think about what are the two factors that are going to, you know, torpedo your proposition? Number one, can you really build it? Okay. Number two, is the market going to love your product? Now, those two things sound really, really simple, but actually they are very complicated. So most uh, techies, when you ask them, can you develop the proposition? And I think Iman will probably um, understand what I mean. They say, yeah, I can code that. That's fine, easy, no problem, yeah? But they missed the point. To build a proposition is not just about the code, it's about, do you have the customer support? Have you thought about your commercial model? Have you thought about your partnership model? Have you thought about your revenue at scale? What would happen if you went from one customer to a thousand customers? Can you hold that kind of infrastructure, right? So it's much bigger than the code, it's everything around it. It's the market proposition, the customer support, the pre-sales, post-sales. And this is where a lot of companies go wrong. So you really need to think about what you need to make that product a success. And you don't need all of it up front. You need a, a step change. Um, and that's the most important thing. So the pilot proposition is, is testing your ability to build the product and all the things you do not have so that you can create an investment case for those things, right? That's the first point. The second point is, will the market hold it? Now, I can tell you from my experience, I have bought and sold now about 10 companies, right? I have bought to, to the market something like 20, 25 products. Some of them are brilliant. Some of them have been absolutely useless. And the difference in every single one of them is at the time, at the time when I launched them, I thought every single one of them was going to be a blockbuster because I'm a positive guy, right? I, I really believe in what I do. And as far as I'm concerned, it's going to work. But the market tells me, kicks me in the teeth and says, no, 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 this is rubbish. Or sometimes you miss something so simple, but to the market is really, really important. So for example, in one of my products, I just missed the ability to have, sorry, the, the ability for the customer, i.e. the pharmaceutical company, just to be able to come back to us and question us on the data. That's it, really simple. But it had a profound impact on them because they, the people we sell to do not understand the data. They build, they make drugs, they sell drugs. They don't understand data. And I hadn't got my head around it because I understand data. So I never think, why would you need to ask me those questions, right? But that simple, that simple change made that product go from nothing to being adopted by every single pharmaceutical company, all the top 30 pharmaceutical companies in the world. So that's just an example. I can give examples from iPlayer, for example, what we did there. But I guess what I'm saying is you can assume the market will hold your product. You don't know. So my advice to any entrepreneur is forget the market, forget how hard it is to crack the market. Answer those two questions. Can you really build this product? Have you, have you factored in everything um, that you need? And if you haven't, and as long as you've factored it in, and you, but you haven't got the ability, as long as you know what you don't have the ability to do, you, you, you can fill that gap with your investment. And number two, you've tested the market and you've got at least one customer, ideally five customers that have used your product and you know, are, are happy. And put that together, and I, I, again, I, I don't wanna to talk too long because I, I, I think there might be some other questions, but we can elaborate a little bit more around how, how to do that. No, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, for sure. And we have other questions coming through, so you can uh, kind of let us know some more details. But um, Iman, kind of crossing back onto the U.S. side here, could you kind of just talk about what it is that's so special about the culture in the U.S. that encourages risk taking and enables serial entrepreneurs like yourself to to really succeed? Yeah, sure. So I think at at a very fu fundamental, foundational level. Um, and I haven't done this in another country, so I'm not sure, but I feel like it's very easy to start companies in the US, paperwork wise. And it's just like in a day, you wanna spin up something, you can literally get something going in, in, in no time. And the second part, from my perspective and my experience, I just there's just a buzz in the air over here. And I don't know if it's just because we're in the Silicon Valley or not, but it's just, it's a buzz where you're constantly around this news of the next startup who's doing what and for better or for worse it it always 
it has an effect on you. And I think this actually had an effect on me uh, after my first acquisition. I was just, you know, I, I had a good, 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 good moment. And I'm just, you know, enjoying what I was doing. And then when you're constantly listening to these narratives about who raised what, who had, who raised this much, who sold for this much. And it started to like have an effect. And, uh, and I was like, started to have this urge to like, let's, what's the next opportunity and, and, you know, personalization. I felt like that's coming up. That's going to be something that everyone's going to need. And so I would say those are a couple of con contributing factors and, and how that can actually help you is if you're a, let's say you're a, a software developer or someone who wants to be the entrepreneur, there's a very good chance that your network, the people that, that are around you, they're also being affected by that same news. And so that helps in that angel investment or that initial money if you do need it, uh, because they're, they're looking for that big exit and they know they need to come in early. So it's completely different to invest in an early stage startup versus coming in and, and, and uh, doing it at a public company. So that, that can help uh, with fundraising. And, and one of the things I don't personally like here again, when you go places, you're always introduced by your position and your latest exit, which is, which is really, really uncomfortable because you just want to make, you know, a new friend. You just, you just, who cares? You sold something or I personally, you know, this is something you've been blessed with. It doesn't define you. It doesn't make you better than others. And, and so we, we have a tendency to like raise people because of these accolades. And I personally don't like that, but then it feeds into this culture of competitiveness. And so it's not uncommon to see someone who's done five startups, seven exits, sold them for billions, but what keeps this person like enough, right? But there's this, there's this drive and, and it may be just be a competitive thing. And, and I think lastly, I would also, I think it's, we have a tremendous uh, startup ecosystem. So there is a lot of help for, for us in terms of people to talk to. The, the, amount, the amount of knowledge and expertise here is, is tremendous. And in the, in the community as a whole, but specifically the Muslim community here is extremely educated, extremely talented. So at, at any moment, if you need an expert in data science, machine vision, health, I mean, any, you name it, we have very, very qualified people uh, that are accessible to us, which makes it a lot easier to vet an idea or build that team that you need to, to uh, execute on, on your vision. <laughs>